I'm Alana Simon. I'm 18 years old, and I'm a survivor of a rare pediatric liver cancer called fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. It's a mouthful, I know. So my story starts a couple years ago. When I was younger, I constantly had these abdominal pains, and no matter how many doctors I saw, nobody could figure out what was causing them. And at first they said it was lactose intolerance, and then they thought it was appendicitis, and then some doctors told me, oh, you're a preteen girl, it's just stress, don't worry about it. That was wrong. Um, eventually, they ended up realizing it was this cancer, fibrolamellar. And as counterintuitive as it sounds, getting this diagnosis was actually kind of a relief for me. Um, it was just nice to finally know what was causing this pain. You know, it seems like worst case scenario, you have cancer, but it was just so scary not knowing what it was. You know, when you're younger, you always think doctors have the cure to everything. You have a problem, so you go see a doctor, they do their medicinal magic, and then they tell you what your problem is, and they fix it. But that was repeatedly not the case for me, which was terrifying. So finally, I knew I had this disease fibrolamellar, but I mean, what did that mean? It was just a jumble of letters that I could barely pronounce, let alone understand. So, you know, first thing I went online, started looking it up, trying to understand what this disease was. What did I have? Um, and that was also scary because the more I looked up, the more I learned about this disease, the more I realized no one actually knew much about this disease. It's pretty rare, not many people know about it. It seemed like no one cared about it, no progress was being made on it. There was no chemotherapy for it at the time, so you know, unless you were lucky enough to catch it early, in which case through a surgery you could get out the entire tumor, it was a, a pretty rough prognosis. And that was terrifying because it seemed like no one cared, and there I was, you know, leaving school, leaving my friends to go sit in a hospital bed and go through surgery. That seemed like something people should care about to me. Um, I was extremely fortunate in my experience in that they were able to catch it early enough that through an intensive liver surgery in which they resected most of my liver, they got out the entire tumor, and I've been fine ever since, you know, six years in remission, and I've been fine. But that isn't the case for most people, sadly. Um, so once I was out of the hospital, better, you know, get back on my feet, learning to walk again, literally, I just wanted to forget the entire experience. You know, put it behind me, it was this bad thing I'd gone through, but I wanted to go back to being normal. The problem was I had this giant scar that traced across my entire torso in the shape of some letter J that was just a constant reminder of my ordeal that marked me as sick, weak, different. Things that, you know, as a little sixth grader just trying to get through middle school, you don't want to have. Um, so I actually went to the drugstores and bought them out of all the scar removal tape I could find and would just lather it on daily, you know, in some futile attempt to make it go away and to make myself look normal, and go back to how things were. Um, but that didn't work out as well as I expected. Um, when I would tell people that I, oh, yeah, I don't, thanks. Um, when you're 12 and, is this better? Cool. Uh, and you would tell people, you know, this scar is from cancer, because people always ask. All of a sudden, people see you and snap. You get the pity face, and something about them changes, and they start treating you differently, and looking at you differently, and they feel so bad. And it comes from the best intentions, of course, but I wasn't really sure how to deal with that. I would just feel uncomfortable. People would just start feeling bad for me, and like, why would they? Here I am, I'm totally fine. I, I didn't need pity, necessarily. I was so lucky. Um, so, <laughs> I used to actually tell people when they would ask that my scar was a shark bite, because, <laughs> You laugh, but it really does look like one. People would buy it all the time. Um, and it was just more fun. It was, a, I guess, kind of a coping mechanism in a game. And you know, every time I'd tell the story, it'd get more nuanced and detailed. And 
it was just way more entertaining to go through all my fun experiences, you know, getting attacked by a shark in Belize when I was 12, than uh, having, and having people think, wow, that's so cool, that's awesome, than people thinking I was this poor girl who'd gone through cancer who they should feel bad for. It was just easier for me. Um, but, you know, I eventually realized this scar and this experience weren't gonna go away. Um, when I was in the hospital, I somehow got involved with this organization called High Lifeline, and they run this program each summer where for two weeks, um, young cancer survivors and patients come together and they have this incredible summer camp where these kids don't focus on all the hard things they're going through in their lives, all the troubles that they're dealing with, everything they've dealt with in the past. They just focus on embracing each moment and you know, living life to the best of their abilities for however long they can. And so I went, and it was one of the most amazing places I have ever been to, one of the greatest experiences I could have possibly imagined. Um, I got here, and all these kids who many of whom were still going through treatment, had had it much worse than I had, weren't ashamed or embarrassed of having gone through or, you know, dealing with cancer. They were more proud of it. I remember there were a couple nights where we would be sitting around in a bunk, you know, having our nightly girl talk, and they started sitting in a circle, and some of my bunk mates, who they'd been at this camp before, they were more familiar with each other, they started comparing their scars and talking about different hospital horror stories, and I was shocked. I just sat there watching in awe because I thought all of this was totally taboo. Like, there they were sitting comparing all their crazy scars, and it was kind of awesome. And just being at this camp and being with all these kids, they were the first kids I'd ever really known who'd had cancer other than you know, there were some kids I shared a room with in the hospital, but we didn't really talk. It was the first kids I'd known who'd had cancer. And it made me so much more proud of having gone through this. Um, I realized it was something that was going to be a part of my identity. It wasn't just something that took up a chunk of my life in middle school. It was going to become part of my identity. And I was okay with that. And. I've actually started coming to see my scar as, instead of some weird, awkward marking that makes my stomach look different from all of my friends, I now think of it as my own version of Harry Potter's lightning scar. It's like a sign that, you know, I faced death and I kicked ass, so. Um. So fast forward a couple years, and you know I'm pretty interested in cancer. I've decided this is going to be a part of my identity. It's something I care about, and I've always been pretty interested in science. Um, my dad's a scientist, so the idea of working in a lab has always been kind of in the back of my head. And I wanted to see if it was something I actually would want to pursue. And I didn't want to work with my dad because I kind of wanted to go off and like be my own scientist, you know, rebellious little teen. Um, so I talked to this teacher at my school and got an internship working at this medical school in New York City. Um, and I'd had some experience with computer science from my high school, so I wanted to work in a lab where I could use computer science to try to study cancer. So I ended up learning about this technique called genetic sequencing in which you can actually look at the sequences of real patients' DNA for their tumor cells and their normal cells and try to compare the two and try to figure out what are the key differences that are causing these normal cells to turn tumorous. Um, and it's incredible. You, there's a lot of data you have to deal with, so it uses pretty new and incredible computer technologies. And one of the problems with it is that in a given adult, you'll have maybe three to 5,000 random mutations just in your normal cells due to chance. Um, and then you'll have even more in your tumor cells because your tumor cells are mutating over time. So if you're trying to find that one key mutation that first turns these tumor cells from normal to tumorous, it's gonna be pretty difficult to isolate that, like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, but so I thought about that. And so if the longer these cells are around, the more they're mutating, 
wouldn't it make sense to study cells that haven't been around for as long? Maybe the cells of a younger person, maybe a person with a pediatric cancer, like fibrolamellar. Um, and so once that idea was in my head, I started thinking maybe this was something that you could actually do. And, you know, people didn't know much about fibrolamellar. There was no base understanding of it, but none of that was necessary for genetic sequencing. You don't have to understand the underlying mechanisms behind the disease. You just need the data. Um, and so I actually I had a pretty cool experience with my disease in that I've been very close with my surgeon. We talk frequently. So I asked him, you know, why can't you just do genetic sequencing on fibrolamellar to try to understand it? Because people don't know much about it. And he said, well, why why can't you? And I realized this was actually something that could potentially be pursued. Um, so I proposed trying this. And for some incredible reason, he was extremely enthusiastic. He's always said that one day I'm going to be a doctor or a scientist or researcher or something. And so when I said, you know, I want to study fibrolamellar, he said, OK, what can I do to help? And so he offered. Um, the help of some of the surgical fellows to mentor me. And he said he would help get the samples to work with. Um, and since my dad has a lab in Rockefeller, they'd never done genetic sequencing before, but he said I could work in the lab and use their facilities and anything else I needed to make this project a reality. So I said, okay. And um, to get the samples, it was kind of hard. I got them from my surgeon, but then also, um, because it's kind of hard to get samples for diseases as rare as this. So this other patient and I actually made this YouTube video in which we tried to encourage patients to actually send us their tumors themselves because people don't realize this, but you actually have control over your own tumors. You know, it's your body. You should have control over it, even though people don't tell you that. Um, and so we've actually been getting patients sending us their data, um, sending us their tumors after surgery. And so... Um, I mean, I still have patients all the time who will email me and say, hi, I just saw your YouTube video online. I got diagnosed. How can I help? How can I be a part of this? And it's incredible. But so within a year, we got IRB approval. We got the tumors sequenced, and they were ready for analysis. So you know, we went through all the data and ended up learning a lot about this disease. Um, one of the most interesting findings was this one mutation that's been identified in every single patient we looked at. Um, and it's this random mutation in one chromosome in which you get these two genes that are typically far apart due to a deletion in between them. These two genes end up getting fused together that create this weird new mutated gene. It's called a chimera gene, like the Greek mythology where you have like the, cre the head of one beast and then the body of another. So you have the head of one gene and then the body of another. And they make this weird, this chimera gene makes a chimera protein that goes on, turns on a whole bunch of other genes, and ends up causing the cancer in these patients. Um, and you only have it in your tumor cells, not your normal cells. And this is a new kind of mutation that hasn't been found in other cancers before. And this, we actually published this in Science Magazine back in February. And since then, hospitals around the world have looked at this research and said, they actually checked their patients for this mutation that we found, and every patient also, that has fibromyalgia also has this mutation, um, which strongly implies that this is what's causing this cancer. And I mean, now that we know that, you can, I've actually been recently trying to work on a blood test to try and diagnose people with this disease, because you know, since there's no good chemotherapy for it, early diagnosis is the key. So, you know, so you don't have to go through the kind of dreadful diagnosis process that I went through and most people with fibrolamellar go through because um, people don't know much about it, so it's hard to diagnose. If you could just diagnose someone through a simple blood test, it'd be so much easier. And also, based on other findings and patterns that we saw in people's DNA and RNA from this research, um, two clinical trials are already getting started pretty soon based on this work for fibrolamellar. Um, which is incredible because this is so much more progress has been made on this disease than I could have ever possibly imagined or than has been made in the past, I don't even know how many years. Um, and it's awesome to 
kind of have been the impetus for that, the fact that my having had cancer has now gone on to have such a positive effect on so many other people with cancer. Um, kind of makes it nice in a way that I had cancer. Um, not that that's a thing people really say, but I don't know. Um, also, I've been working, I was saying that um, you know, patients need to try to get control of their data themselves. We've also started working on this website, like the Fibromyalgia Registry, in which patients can actually upload their data onto this website. It's still in the beginning stages. Um, and then researchers from around the world can actually access this de-identified data. So instead of a given researcher having to struggle to get the to get the samples themselves, you know, making YouTube videos, reaching out to patients, if hospitals around the world can share their data to each other, then hopefully that'll inspire more researchers to work on these rare diseases where it's hard to get the, the samples. Um, and then also it'll make this whole research process much more collaborative. Um, and then also patients can just feel more empowered to actually have control over the disease. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm just a kid, obviously. <laughs> um, but, and I'm not some crazy genius or anything. I just had this one area that I really cared about and I had the opportunity and the resources to do something about it. And I mean, through just pursuing this, I was able to make such a difference on this fibromyalgia community in not that long of a time. So I don't know, it's just been an incredible experience, but I hope that this project keeps flourishing. It's grown so much since it first started out as this little idea I was talking about with my dad and my surgeon to what it is now. Um, I mean, I just hope that can flourish and I hope I can inspire. I know there are lots of you out there who may be struggling with rare diseases or any disease, or you have friends or family who are, you know, you can take control of your own disease. You, as the patients, it's kind of your responsibility to take action. With things like fibromyalgia that are so rare, not many people know about it. No one's gonna go out and research it. It's the patients themselves who care about it, who have to go and make the change, so, yeah. <laughs>